Welcome. Hi, everybody. I'm Victoria Alexander, and welcome to Buying Into Brooklyn, but welcome to Buying Into New York. Doesn't have to be Brooklyn. We cover the five boroughs. Um, housekeeping. Uh, you can ask questions in the chat. Farah my, is go, from my team is going to um, put a message there right now so you know where the chat is. She'll be sharing relevant links throughout the presentation. So look out there for information going towards specific um, topics that we talk about. Then um, you'll be email the recording of this presentation as well as our Buying into Brooklyn ebook. And I'm going to change this to do not disturb. So people stop texting me about their landlord. And um, so you can share it with whoever. The video will go on YouTube. So you can share it with everyone, rewatch it, and you'll get our Buying into Brooklyn ebook that has our guide with the most comprehensive book that I think is out there to, for the buying process in New York City. Um, and you can also listen to it on Spotify if you don't want to have to look at us. And you can contact any of us afterwards with questions if you don't feel comfortable asking them today. We also have something called um, the Women Owned Business Spotlight Series through our blog, um, where we highlight women owned businesses here in Brooklyn, give them a platform um, to promote them. It's very hard to get press these days, and flex you're paying a lot of money for it. So, with our great SEO, it's always great to support other small local women owned businesses. Um, we have a whole landing page of I think close to 100 businesses. Um, and I'm Victoria Alexander, and welcome to Buying Into Brooklyn. I, there's going to be some poll questions too throughout the presentation. Um, answer those if you can. I'm going to wait two more minutes. I think everybody found the chat and the poll and a relaunch. Oh, there you go. Um, and that's going to kill some time talking about something after this presentation i'm gonna have to jump off at 5 55 because i'm speaking i'm a facilitator at a meeting for red hook um, we're speaking with our city council person and the economic development committee about the cruise ship contract that came here to red hook and i've been preparing for weeks my statement um, along with other three other facilitators so it starts at six so i have to run down the block to the community center um, to facilitate the conversation on economic development. So you'll have to excuse me, Farah and Andrew and Lisa will be taking over at that point and you can ask all their questions there. Um, oh, and a couple more people want to be admitted, so great. Okay, so I think it's 5.04. I'm gonna start with intros and get things going. Hi, I'm Victoria Alexander and welcome to Buying Into Brooklyn. I'm the owner of Realty Collective, a boutique real estate firm. I started, I have to update this now, 19 years ago, now that it's 2024, um, in July of 2005, to defy the stereotypes associated with uh, real estate agents here in New York City. Um, we all know those uh, and they're not so great. So I thought we could do things a little bit different and hopefully in the last 19 years, I've done that. So this workshop is designed to outline the buying process. In no way is it comprehensive. Comprehensive. So just realize you're getting an overview and going into nuts and bolts will, for your specific deal will happen when you work with your team. New York City is different from anywhere else. So if you've bought in property of like in Boston, in California, in North Carolina, it is nothing like here, especially with the condo and co-op market. It can be overwhelming, especially if you've never done it before. And so we'll give you a good place to start today. We offer this workshop freely so that you have a place to, so you have that information at your fingertips to make educated decisions and tear down the gatekeeping information that is often used as a scary sales tactic to frighten you into working with people that might not be the best people to work with for this job. These are jobs, make sure you're interviewing people and you like them. Um, you may not wanna work with me as your buyer's broker, do not go this alone, get a buyer's broker. I cannot encourage you enough to do this. You will never have the expertise and industry knowledge that you have that you will get from working with an agent um, that will help you make avoid missteps that you might be making. That's not scales tactic. It's it's not I'm not saying that you have to work with me. I'm just saying work with a buyer's agent. That is my 
honest advice. I even worked with an agent when I was buying something because you are, you're not a good barometer to make logical decisions without getting your emotions get in the way. This is the most, um, the biggest financial decision you'll ever make for most people. And so you should have a expert at your side, multiple experts. Um, so we'll provide the basics you need to know before starting your journey as well as provide you with the tools to make some of the first steps. We want everyone to feel empowered and educated. Like I said, this is the biggest investment you'll make and you wanna make sure you're making the right decision for yourself and hire expert you need to guide you and help you avoid costly mistakes. Um, also, Farah launched the poll, okay, and this help will do some market research about what's going on right now. Dream team. So, I have been working with um, Cirque Briscoe, Cirque Contreat, Andrew, usually work with Rashida in that office, but they've got great um, lawyers throughout, and Andrew's stepping in today for Rashida and Lisa for a very long time, and the three of us together have done multiple deals together can say that for Andrew too. Um, we've done several deals together and knowing the other people on your team, the other, and that they can work together and hold each other accountable is super important. So you wanna make sure that you are picking people that did not just get into this industry that has long-term relationships and have um, long-term relationship with your lawyer and your mortgage bro broker, as well as your buyer broker so that they can check in with each other and that they will actually have enough rapport that you'll, they'll be able to move the deal forward. So um, I'm going to pass it off to Andrew. Andrew, why don't you start and introduce yourself and then pass it to Lisa. Sure. Thanks, Victoria. Uh, mm -hmm. My name is Andrew Consumanis. Uh, I'm a real estate attorney based in Brooklyn Heights in the downtown Brooklyn area. Uh, I've been working uh, at Serpico, Serpico and Sadiq for almost 20 years. Um, and I have done everything here. I began as a, you know, an administrative assistant, gopher type thing, um, evolved into a paralegal office manager, went to law school at night and became an attorney. Um, so I've been here for a very long time. Um, I've seen, you know, hundreds or thousands of real estate transactions and all sorts of things that can happen throughout. Um, so, um, you know, we get a good good taste of you know how things can go awry and you know how we can get a get ahead of those um, you know potential obstacles to try to keep things on track and get everybody to closing, which is um, everybody's goal. Everybody involved um, you know wants to get to closing, and it's nice to have a a common goal um, because real estate transactions are usually not um, adversarial. Um, so I, I'm substituting for Rashida today. She's not able to make the meeting. Um, but as Victoria said, uh, Rashida, Lisa, and her have worked together on dozens of deals, if not more. And I, I'm often, uh, in the background or sometimes, uh, the lead at our firm, um, on those transactions. It's always a pleasure working with Lisa and her team, as well as Victoria and her team, and, uh, hope to get to do so with, uh, any and all of you. And, uh, Thanks, Andrew. Take it away, Lisa. Hey, guys. My name is Lisa. I'm a loan officer, Cross Country Mortgage. I have been doing this for about 10 years, I guess. And um, my specialty is New York City, um, specifically first time home buyers. I like working with first time home buyers. I love helping you buy your first home. It's scary and exciting. And I really like being a part of it. Um, I'm licensed throughout the country, so I can do deals everywhere. Um, and, uh, I'm excited to answer your questions and see how we can help. Thank you. Um, so what is everybody's job? Let me start there. I think some of it's self-explanatory, but I will um, go into it. So as a buyer's broker, I am your matchmaker, your therapist, your sounding board, your guide, your expert that has been doing this, you know, over 20 years. I've said, I've had the company for 19, doing this over 20 years, um, to whatever it takes to get you to your goals. Your goal is to buy something. We're going to help you meet your goals, not pushing you into anything that you don't feel comfortable with, or that isn't right for you and helping you along the journey to get to you 
where you want to be. Um, I've had people that have done this in three months. I've had people that done it in three years and I had the longest one is five years. So um, that's the record to beat of how long you could be in the buying process uh, to get to where you want. And that doesn't matter to me. I feel like guiding and nurturing people um, and educating about the process is really important. And it just sometimes takes a lot, a lot longer to save and get to you know, where they're going. Um, and that's, you know, just part of the journey. So I'm here for all of it. And let's see, a also is a wild roller coaster of emotions and, you know, keeping you tempered and getting you out of the way of yourself is also part of the buying process and my job is to make sure that you stay rational and logical and not emotional. And we're literally, it's to just guide you and give you advice based on almost my 20 years of experience in the Brooklyn market. I've experienced a lot of different things and it's my job to get you into your first home and make you a homeowner if that's what your goal is. Um, I'm assuming since you're on this call, that is uh, hopefully in your goals for 2024 and to protect you from your own instincts and, and get you to the closing table. So what do buyers brokers cost? In New York City, it can be reasonably assumed that a majority of sellers brokers, especially if they're revenue members, are paying for the broker fees. Um, broker fees are always negotiable um, and the sellers recognize the importance of paying a buyer's broker and that trend will likely persist. Um, if a commission for a buyer's broker for isn't been pre-negotiated for a property, your agent will inform you and ensure you receive the necessary professional support during that. This significant financial tra transaction while also making sure the costs are consistent with market conditions. So make sure that someone is communicating to you about the commissions associated with the properties that you're interested in looking at. There are three people that you need for this transaction. There's gonna be a lot of people that are participating in this transaction, but three you need. A buyer's agent, your attorney, and your mortgage professional. Having a buyer's agent is important because they are, have a fiduciary responsibility to you. When you walk into a listing and you see an agent there, that person represents the seller, and the fiduciary responsibility, their fiduciary responsibility goes to the seller. When you put in an offer, they are negotiating on behalf of the seller unless they have, you have negotiated with them to be your dual agent. They will always be representing the seller. So when you contact the agent's name on the listing, that's also what's happening. Unless you came through like the Street Easy Experts program, the Street Easy purposely knows that buyers don't have the expertise at their fingertips. They are looking for themselves and they're not represented. And they put them in touch with experts in the field based on, you know, similar listings that they have sold or knowledge of the neighborhood. You want to interview these people. You want to make sure you feel comfortable with them and they can answer your questions in a way that you comprehend and in layman's terms. And you can feel that you can take advice from them because all of their job is to guide you through the process just in different ways. Um, and personality type is important. If you don't get along with them and you don't feel like get their sense of humor or things don't feel awkward slightly, you know, it's, it's this is an intimate transaction, a intimate journey that like is also a transaction. So you want to feel like that person on the other side is, um, you know, someone that is relatable to you and you ha can have confidence in and give them personal information and say what you need to say to actually get you through this transaction. So if pick advisors that have, also pick advisors that have relationships in the industry, because that is an important part of this also. You do not wanna hire your uncle that is a lawyer that, you know, is doing criminal law and you need a real estate lawyer. You need a New York City real estate lawyer that does co-ops and condos and houses on a daily basis. This is their bread and butter. They don't do anything else. And you want a mortgage company that is based in New York City that understands New York City condos and co-ops and not Rocket Mortgage, not Quicken, not any of these online apps. Those pre-approval letters do not fly when you're submitting offers. Uh, so make sure you're getting pre-approved from somebody uh, that has these three things. We already did the intros, so why buy now? Next slide, sorry. The rent is too high. You want to do your own design. You want to make long-term investments. You want to build equity. Right now, the cost between renting and buying has gotten pretty close again. It, as when 
interest rates were above 7%, I would say that that wasn't true, but I think we're getting back down there and that rents, especially in Brooklyn, are pretty close to what you would be paying for purchasing. So if you're looking to stay in Brooklyn for the next three to five years, then buying is probably your best investment um, and to finding stability. If you want to really crunch the numbers, the New York Times has something called the rent versus buy matrix. Matrix, uh, Farah is gonna put the link in the chat. You can plug in your numbers and see if it makes financial sense for you to buy. If it doesn't, if you're in a rent stabilized or rent controlled apartment, or you live with your parents or some other miraculous New York City situation, might not be in your best interest to buy something, but you should plug the numbers in. And based on what it tells you, that's, I would encourage you to um, fall through on that because if you plan on staying here, like I said, I've been here 13 years. I bought my house. Sorry, I've been in my house 14 years. I've lived in New York over 20 years and I would not be able to afford to rent my house right now. My mortgage is less than I would pay in rent and I would have definitely been pushed out of Red Hook at this point. Um, and I didn't want to buy this house. My agent, Tina, who works for me, convinced me to buy this house. I needed somebody at my side to talk myself out of the these ridiculous expectations I had about what my first home was gonna be like, cause I, and that I thought I was gonna leave here in, after five years, and I'm still here 14 years later this January. Um, so previously mentioned the dream team, your lawyer, your mortgage professional, and um, your buyer's broker. You also might need an inspector, most likely. You wanna have whatever you're buying inspected, um, a contractor if you need to do work, an architect, and these are all names of people that we can recommend. So now that you found your dream team, you've gotten pre-approved, that's the first call. So, so you're assembling your dream team. So your first call is not on Street Easy. Your first call is to your mortgage professional and understanding what your purchase power is. If you're self-employed, it's important to talk to this person first because the banks have a very different criteria for somebody that's self-employed than versus somebody that has a normal nine to five job. And you want to present the best version of yourself to the banks. So it's important to do this step first so that your properties and your expectations are aligned with each other and you're buying, you know what your buying power is and you're not misleading yourself when you're going out to look on the internet and in person. So I'm going to pass it to Lisa to talk about the financing piece because this is the first step in the process. Totally. Thank you. So yes, the first step is you want to get pre-approved. Um, why you want to do that is because you want to make sure that you're looking at homes that you can afford from the mortgage perspective, because it's no fun to look at a house that's way above what you can get pre-approved for. You also maybe don't want to undercut what you think you're pre-approved for if, in fact, you could be approved for more. Again, just because you're pre-approved for, let's say, $600,000 loan doesn't mean you're going to get a $600,000 loan. It just lets you know what your purchase power is. Um, so I think probably one of the misconceptions of my job is that a mortgage is actually a pretty personal process. Um, I'm going to ask you a lot of questions. Um, I'm going to ask you about your work history. I'm going to ask you, are you self-employed? I'm going to ask where the down payment's coming from. I'm going to ask if you've owned before or not. Why I ask these questions is because all of this helps me find the right product for you. Um, I work at Cross Country Mortgage, which is a correspondent lending bank. That basically means we work just like the big banks, but all we do is mortgages. I have about 90 products. So through our conversation, I can figure out which is going to be the right product for you. It very well may be a standard 20% down 30-year loan. It may not. Um, we have special first-time homebuyers programs. Um, some of them are income restricted. Some of them are not. Um, so we'll talk to see if one of those programs you would qualify for, if you would want to go that route, it gives you down payment assistance, which is great. Um, you can also, while the standard is to put down 20%, which is typically what's required for co-ops, you can put down as little as 10, five, or even three and a half percent with an FHA loan. FHA loans are typically for single and multifamily properties, not condos or co-ops. Um, so if you're self-employed, if you're self-employed, you definitely can get a mortgage. However, I definitely need to see your tax returns. So if you're self-employed, now is actually a great time to talk to a mortgage professional so that we can have that conversation before you file your returns for 2023. 
once your returns are filed, it is what it is. Nothing can be changed. If you have, if you're working on a draft with your accountant, we can have a conversation about maybe some things in dialogue with me and your accountant. You want to change on your tax return to help your buying power for mortgage. Um, the once we have that conversation, you fill out an application. I do a soft pull on your credit, um, and then you get a pre-approval letter. And that pre-approval is really a working draft. So as you start to um, see things with Victoria and really figure out what you want, we fine tune that pre-approval letter to the property that you actually see. Um, that's about it. And then, oh, a few things. The pre-approval letter that I give you, it is a financial snapshot based on the information that you've given me at the time. So if you change your job, if you get a new credit card, if you buy a new car, these are all things that could effectively, you know, affect your pre-approval. That doesn't mean you can't do those things. That means you want to talk to me before you do them. You want to make sure that if, if you're doing X, Y, and Z, it's not going to affect the program that we have sort of thought might be the best fit for you. Um, and then you go and see things with Victoria and we stay in the loop so that we're ready to go once you find the right place. So when you go out and look at things, most brokers are going to ask if you're pre-approved and they want to know that you already have this document in hand and that you've gone through this process because otherwise it's a waste of time for them. So if you're just going to open houses, they don't need to know. But once you get serious and you want to do schedule singular appointments, this is an important part of that. Um, talking to somebody that is in New York City and that has expertise in the New York City market like Lisa is important. You'd want to make sure that they're familiar with co-ops and condos and can do financing in these types of buildings. There are banks that I encourage you not to work with, like in the last year, had difficulty with Wells Fargo's getting appraisals done. Um, like there are challenges of thing that only working with industry um, professionals is going to help guide you in making sure that you don't work with some a product or with a person that is not going to is going to make to get in the way and cost you money, time, energy. You know, you can get an appraisal redone. There's just many steps to it and it costs money to get a second appraisal and to fight an appraisal. So you want to get an appraisal done the right the first time, not the second or third time. So um, making sure you pick the banks that don't have a problem giving appraisals in New York City because this is not their target market um, is important. Even if Wells Fargo is your bank, going to Wells Fargo is not going to give you a better rate unless you have lots and lots of money with them um, and they're giving you some sort of special uh special rate for having a special client. Um, so if you have that kind of money, you probably don't need to be on this class. No. <laughs> and, and just to, to clarify what Victoria means by a lot of money is millions and millions of dollars. Millions yeah. and millions of dollars. <laughs> like you're like a lot of money isn't a hundred or two hundred thousand dollars. Like you're getting a preferential rate for your mortgage only if you have large, large amounts of money in a bank, right? So Chase or City will be like, oh well since Mr. So-and-so, you have $5 million with you. We're going to give you a mortgage at 3% because you have $5 million with you. And we, you want to take a mortgage and not use your cash because we want your cash because we can make more money off your cash in our bank than the 3%. So it's in their benefit to do those kind of deals. And so that's the only time it's worthwhile going to your bank um, directly uh, unless they have some sort of amazing credits for you. But I would say that the mortgage professionals that we work with usually can match those credits, uh, like closing cross credits uh, programs. So make sure you're hiring New York City experts that know the market. It's same thing with your lawyer, too. You want make people to make sure that they are familiar with co-ops and condos. Um, like I said, Quicken, Rocket Mortgage, also off the table. Anything that's like app-based is not going to fly here. Um, and New York City, the special piece, blah, 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 and deal with person, up real person. So you're ready to buy a home. We're going to establish your buying process and a strategy. Um, I'm going to ask you some questions that are going to be important to your search about your timing, your budget, your family, your lifestyle, quality of life to help us narrow down um, where we're going to be looking and what your time frame is and what you need in a neighborhood and what you need in a building. How long are you going to live there and what your budget is, not just what you can afford, but how much can you afford monthly 
with your maintenance or your common charges, uh, your taxes. If there's a tax abatement now, when that, does that tax abatement run out while you're in the, the plan on staying in the building? And you need to take that into consideration that you're going to be forced out once the, the building's tax abatement expires because you will no longer be able to afford the monthly. So these are all conversations we have to make sure you're comfortable um, and we create a strategy together and you and I are on the same page. Do you have a family or going to be starting a family and what considerations you need to think about for that? Your commute, um, school district, lifestyle, what things you need to be happy? Like, do you need to be by the park? Do you need to be by transportation? Do you need to be by a your favorite dive bar? You know, what is important to you to, to make the your quality of life really high? Because like we all know in New York City that there has to be value to counteract the other things to, that we have to deal with for for the New York life. So um, making sure you get those things. And like, do you want new construction or do you want old Brooklyn? Is it important to have amenities in your building like a gym and a doorman? So there's a quick overview of the types of housing you might see in New York City in a link that Farah is gonna post in the chat. Um, we're gonna go to the next slide. So we're gonna think about location. So if you have a, a wide net right now, the biggest thing I tell people is that if you have a list of five or 10 neighborhoods on your possible neighborhoods you can live on, live in, what you're gonna do is, besides going to look at listings, we're also going to have you call your friends that live in these neighborhoods. If you don't have friends there, I'll find you a friend there or a client there, um, and we'll have them give us the local tour. You'll call your friend, say, hey, can we get brunch on you Sunday? Got him? Oh, sorry. Good. Oh, somebody needs to mute. Um, and then um, we'll give you, ask them for their, the, what they like or don't like about living in this neighborhood. What are their pros and cons? And then, you know, they're gonna be there, give you their honest opinion. And then you're gonna see if that's something that you want in a neighborhood. They might have very different expectations and needs because um, of all the different sorts of things, but that you wanna say, oh, that sounds great. That's what I'm looking for too. Or you know what, that is not what I'm looking for. And they can give you a firsthand experience and then they'll go to brunch, you'll catch up with somebody and you'll get a real experience of what it's like in that neighborhood. And then you can come back at night with another friend and walk around. Like you wanna test it out. Um, and having your friends give their firsthand, you know, unsolicited advice is going to really narrow it down for you. So that's location, right? Then site. Um, This is the other thing that goes with neighborhood, but always is the hardest thing to align with that part was like the quality of life versus what the building stock is. Um, if you wanna be in a doorman, pre-war doorman building, there's not that many neighborhoods, right? It's Brooklyn Heights, Prospect Heights, a um, little bit of Park Slope maybe, um, but you're not getting a lot of, of that. It's Upper East Side and Upper West Side, not in Brooklyn so much. So, uh, oh, sorry, Ditmas and Kensington, you didn't get that. There's few and far between. If you want new construction, Gowanus, um, downtown Brooklyn, Williamsburg, Bushwick, some Bed-Stuy sprinkled here and there. If you want Brownstone, Brooklyn, Brooklyn Heights, just to go back to Prospect Heights, um, Cobble Hill, Carroll Gardens, Park Slope, you know, industrial, edgy, you know, Long Island City, maybe Bushwick. Like there are different neighborhood characteristics that tie into the neighborhood, but also the neighbor, the type of building. So if you want a gym, more likely gonna get that in a new construction building than you are in a pre-war building. So you're gonna probably push you towards certain neighborhoods based on the amenities that you want also. And I always tell people to make their list of five deal breakers and then realize you probably can only demand two or three of those deal breakers because everything in New York is about making um, concessions, especially when we're living in such an expensive city. Uh, I also go over what your closing costs will be, like co-ops is like one to 3% of, of the closing costs, which is about $4,000 depending, and then three to 5% for condos. New construction also is only condos and those fees for have also include transfer taxes and some developers try to include their um, their lawyer's fees and other fees uh, in negotiating the deal, depending on what kind of market we're in. Are we in a buyer's market or a seller's market? I think that we're about to be in a seller's market as things shift. Um, I don't know who else is feeling that yet, but that's what the 
interest rates and, and temperament has gone for the last week. So, but Jen, 2024 has just begun. So, so where do you find these homes? Next slide. So where do you search? The internet has changed everything. Everything is more transparent so that it's there at your fingertips. All brokers who are members of Rebney have to work together and have access to the same listings. So we all have a database that's shared together. So there's no pocket listings. There's no hidden listings off the market. And if you're using Trulia or Zillow, a lot of that information is not up to date and they mislabel condos as co-ops and co-ops as condos and they don't have the right tax information. Even though Street Easy is owned by Zillow, they sometimes get the information wrong, which doesn't make any sense. Like Realtor.com and Redfin, which is Redfin is just taking good scraping the internet for all the other different sites. So try to figure out like Street Easy to me is the most user friendly and most up to date because they penalize brokers for not keeping their information up to date because you have to pay for rentals to be on there. Um, it's the most accountable um, data listing site, even though I know a lot of people feel like Zillow or Trulia is what, what they're looking at. Um, so the date, those days of off, those off market listings aren't there anymore. If you wanna be in a specific block or something like that, you can work with a broker to strategize on how to do that. But if you're mostly waiting for listings to come on the market or working with brokers that specialize in a neighborhood or in buildings that um, you're interested in to get the next listing and have a competitive edge, even though like so there, I have these buyers right now that wanted to be in a specific building. And so they contacted me because I've sold many times in the building and they, maybe they contacted me because they thought I would list the next listing in that building. But they also work with me because I already had all of the due diligence documents that all the other brokers knew I've done a deal. They can look and see I've done a deal in the building and know that I can close a deal in the building and how to prepare my client for that. And they knew that um, if somebody was gonna list, they might actually interview me, so I might have a tip on it before anybody else. So working with agents that are familiar with a very specific building you want to be into, be in is a, also a strategy you could use if there is something like that. Um, Rebney has its own backend database that we use um, and that your broker that you are working with should um, set you up with, so you're getting listings through, through there. Um, I went over a street using Trulia and just and we'll set up the search for you and aggregate all the listings to you in one site because of the backend database for brokers, which you don't have access to unless you're working with an agent. Um, keep in mind when you're looking at listings online, you'll see the seller's agent's information and wanna reach out to them yourself and think it will streamline the process. But remember, the seller's agent represents the financial best interest of the seller. They don't have the best interest at heart of you and they can end up losing you money when, you, when you're trying to save money and a buyer's broker represents you and the buyer represents your best interest. And we'll have to make sure that to ask the right questions and develop a competitive offer strategy for you to make sure not only do you get the best price, but that you also win the bid because that's really the most challenging thing in these times. Um, so making an offer and negotiating, importance of being ready. So the first thing I do after you've gotten your pre-approval from Lisa is tell you to do your other homework. And that even if you're not putting in an offer, I get you ready to put in your offer. You have you write your cover letter and get your revenue submit offer form together so that it's ready to go. So when the property that you do love is hits the market and you go and see it at the first open house, that your offer is first. My clients, both of them put in offers this week. Both of them got accepted because they were the first offer in and other reasons, but that it says something to sellers when your offer is the first offer in and that you're working with brokers that have relationship with the other broker on the side of the other side of the deal um, because they have repeat deals together and understand that the seller's agent strategy and temperament can give you a real competitive advantage. So when I know on the other side that Lucy Perry or um, Deb Breeders or Tina is on the other line, side of the deal, done so many deals with them, they are like, oh, great, another deal with Victoria. We know what this is going to look like. We're going to negotiate for our clients and she's going to negotiate for hers and we're going to come to a meeting of the minds and and if there's no wild card when they work with agents that they don't know that hasn't been around that long that's a wild card they are they going to get this deal to the closing table have they prepped their clients is their financing financing actually coming through have they done their due diligence 
you want to make sure that you're working with agents that have that sort of experience um, in the in the industry and a reputation. Um, negotiation, work with agents to create and devise a strategy. Everything needs to be negotiated before you accept an offer and be prepared to submit to the lawyers on the deal sheet. So contingencies, are you? is it contingent on financing? Is it contingent on inspection? Are you willing to waive any of those contingencies? Are you interested in putting in a, an appraisal contingency in? Um, these are the types of things that you're going to use to leverage your position um, and make sure you win the, the, the offer and get um, to the deal sheets out. The, client, the seller can walk away until you and them also sign the contract. So until that happens, they can walk away. So anybody else putting an offer in, even if your offer is accepted, somebody can come out of the woodwork and offer more than you. Um, even if you've signed and sent the 10%, if they have not countersigned, they're going to be uh, hoping to try to squeeze as much money as possible out of the situation if they feel like it's worthwhile, because sometimes that also can backfire and there's pros and cons to that. So. So the contract terms on the deal sheet need to be, is it an as is sale, offer contingent inspection consent? Will you guys, um, why don't, Andrew, why don't you talk about what happens when the deal sheets go out and what, take it from there. Sure, so um, your attorney's you know, usually available in advance or while you're making offers and looking around to answer questions. Um, but we really start to work when the deal sheet is circulated. Um, the deal sheet is, usually a spreadsheet. It lists the parties involved and the basic terms of the transaction, like the price, the property address, any contingencies or particular inclusions or exclusions. Um, so the seller's attorney uh, is the attorney that drafts the contract uh, for review by the purchaser's attorney. Um, during that contract drafting period, your, your attorney is also doing due diligence on the cooperative or the condominium. Um, what due diligence is, uh, is an examination of the, the co-op or the condo's financial records and history, uh, as well as its formative and governing documents. So all co-ops and condos have what's called an offering plan, which is a, um, you know, a big fat book, probably hundreds of pages, um, which describes you know, aspects of ownership, what's involved with purchasing, the purchase process, closing costs, um, it includes forecasted budgets, and uh, we review the offering plan. We we read financial statements. Um, very importantly, we review board meeting minutes. Co-ops and condos have boards which operate the buildings on behalf of the unit owners in a condo, shareholders in a co-op, and um, these meetings are very important because they you know that the minutes tell us what's going on uh, as of late in the building you know, compare minutes to financial statements, you know, financial statements are prepared on an annual basis, but minutes are, you know, a monthly update on what's happening in the building. So when we read the minutes, we can find out if there are any, you know, problematic issues um, or, you know, potential issues that we see our clients encountering after closing so we could advise them before they sign a contract. Um, our goal when we do due diligence is to, you know, dig up as much information as we can about the building, um, present it or present a lot of it to our client and then allow our client to make their decision on whether or not they want to proceed to purchase. And, um, you know, we usually don't find reasons for purchasers to not proceed. Um, and it's, it's because every building has issues. There are, you know, very few perfect buildings, if any, um, you know, issues are similar across the board, you know, sometimes uh, a building had a leak, or, you know, a building had, you know, some packages stolen from the vestibule, things like that, um, which are probably not deal breakers, or really shouldn't be deal breakers, so long as we see buildings uh, addressing the issues. Um, so also with reading the minutes, we, um, we submit a questionnaire to the building's managing agent, which is essentially, a, you know, it's a list of pointed questions asking for information that we probably would not be able to obtain by simply reviewing board meeting minutes or reading financial statements. Um, you know, and depending on what we see when we read the minutes and read the other documents, you know, we may have lots of questions, lots of follow-up questions or not many. 
Um, but it varies from building to building. Um, again, our goal, or one of our goals is to be thorough enough to give our purchasing client, uh, you know, an accurate picture of the current condition of the building from a, you know, a financial and a, um, a governance standpoint, as well as in a good indication of what might be to come um, based on what we have found. And, um, you know, we present that information and as long as the purchaser is okay with it, we, you know, proceed to, to purchase. Um, and that, that due diligence process takes time because it is a lot of information to sort through. Uh, we do do it while we are simultaneously negotiating the contract. And, you know, depending on response times from the management company or the board, if it's a self-managed building, you know, we could get it done in as, you know, as little as a few business days, but um, realistically, it's it's more often, you know, anywhere from five to 10 business days until we get all the information that we need and are able to um, to review it with our clients. Yeah, especially with co-op um, management companies that make it difficult to get the information um, and you want to make sure that they get the the questionnaire fee, because if they haven't gotten the questionnaire fee, they're not going to get the questionnaire back to your attorney or to your mortgage professional who also needs a questionnaire to make sure that they can approve the building. Because Lisa, do you want to just talk about what you're doing now while the deal, you know, once I say, hey, we have an accepted offer here and deal sheets are out, what are you guys doing in prep for us to sign the contract? Yep. So, um, so, well, first of all, because we've done so much work up front, and in that pre-approval process, you've given me a lot of docs. We're halfway there. Um, also, by the way, giving me docs up front is really important to help you get the offer as well. Because nine times out of 10, when you put in an offer with Victoria, the seller's agent is going to call me. And they're going to say, hey, I see that you have a pre-approval for Jane Smith. Uh, how does the deal look? And if I can say, oh, you know what? I have looked at their income docs. I have looked at their asset docs. This is their credit score. This all looks great. Then that is a really, really good motivation for them to accept your offer. Because nobody wants to accept an offer that's going to die in underwriting. Um, so, uh, but once Victoria lets me know that the deal is happening, then I start getting any updated documents from you. I do a preliminary search of the condo or co-op. We have a live database of condos and co-ops. So I can see if there are any red flags with the building that we need to address right away. Um, also, another reason why it's really, really great to work with a team that works together a lot is when Rashida and Andrew do their due diligence, if they see something that they think might be an issue for the bank, they're going to let me know. And they're going to say, hey, I'm looking at the minutes and this came up. Is that going to be a problem? Um, there's these many, this many you know, investment units. Is that going to be a problem? And the more, nine times out of 10, because I have so many products, I can find a solution to the problem. It's about knowing about it sooner rather than later. Now, in terms of the questionnaire, that gets ordered once it's a live deal. So once Andrew and Rashida have finished the contract and it's signed by you and the seller, so it's a live deal, then we get the appraisal ordered and we get the questionnaire ordered from the management company. Now, sometimes, um, you know, uh, Andrew or Rashida might have a questionnaire that we can at least look at to, to get the answers that they've already received as we wait for them to fill out the bank questionnaire that we need from the management company to approve the project. Um, Andrew, is there anything else you wanted to say about contract before we get into underwriting? Um, I, just, I forgot to mention the inspection part. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so while everybody's doing their due diligence, what you're also doing is getting an inspection. You have an inspector come and look at the property. So usually what it is is to see any red flags, like the boiler is going to have to be replaced in five years or that the roof is wearing and in five or 10 years, they're going to have to maintain it. If it's a co-op or condo, if it's your own building, that's going to be on you. So you won't be able to split the cost with five or 10 or a hundred other people. The cost comes down to one owner if you're buying a house. So having an inspector to come to understand what the lifetime uh, of your the appliances 
the appliances, the mechanicals of the building, the structure is um, to you is important. And then um, understanding just how things work. You're going to be the person that's going to be maintaining things from now on. So knowing, understanding how they operate. So you can do a job good job getting the most life out of them. So having an inspector, if there are things that do come up that were not disclosed to us, because sometimes if people know things, um, they want to get ahead of the information and those are the best uh, scenarios. If saying, oh, well, we know that the boiler is going to be an issue before you put in an offer, we should know that the boiler has to be replaced in the next year or two because of this, this, or this. So that's a point you probably wouldn't be able to negotiate after the inspector comes because they've told us ahead of time. But if the inspector finds something like there was a leak here, there's water damage, this is an ongoing issue, the business, the building never, there's not in the minutes, there's nothing here, you know, this is something that an ongoing issue. That's something we can then address uh, when we're negotiating the contract to make sure that it's not going to fall on you to be responsible for things that are could be costly in the future. Then um, once the, if we give the red green light for the F the inspection to the lawyers that's when they're saying it's okay to sign the contract and that you need to make sure that 10 percent of your funds are in a liquid account so that you can sign the contract um because that's what you need usually right andrew 10 percent yeah 10 percent is typical um although everything is subject to negotiation right. everything okay. so long as everything's you negotiable the rest of the money like lisa mentioned you know it's typical to have a 20% down with 80% financing. And what that means it, for a purchaser's cash is that the 10, 10 of that 20% will be paid when the contract is signed. The remaining 10% will be brought to the closing. Um, but if you're you know, putting 5% down, you would put 5% down on signing and then 95% would be mortgage proceeds brought to the closing. Um, so again, typically 10%, but, you know, based on whatever Lisa can work out with financing, it could be less. Um, great. So now that they've signed the contract, the heavy listing is really going towards the attorney and your mortgage professional, unless you're doing a co-op and then I'm helping you work on your board package. But the most important thing is that you get all of your paperwork to the mortgage professional first to Lisa, because that the underwriting, we cannot submit your board package until you have your commitment and you cannot get your commitment until Lisa has everything. So you want to make sure that the first person that gets all their documents is Lisa. And then I'm working on, like I said, I'm working on your board package and helping you prep for the board interview if it's a co-op. And Lisa is going to talk about due diligence, turn times and underwriting and rate locks. Sure. So we're in contract. Woohoo! So this is not a surprise because we've been in conversation this whole time. I've been working on getting everything ready. And now that we have a fully signed contract by buyer and seller, it's what we call a live deal. So we get you initial disclosures to e-sign. We get the appraisal ordered. If it's a condo or co-op, we get condo or co-op documents ordered from the management company. And we work on getting you through underwriting. Um, this frankly is one of the places where me and my team really shine. We're just incredibly fast. We're fast in part because I've done a lot of work up front. We're also just fast because we are good at our job. So um, we get you through underwriting. You're going to get through underwriting with us in probably two to four days um, versus two to three weeks. Um, usually we have to wait until the appraisal comes back to get you a clean commitment. So that means um, part of the contract has a mortgage contingency clause which means you need to have a commitment letter before that mortgage contingency expires in order to protect your down payment. So um, we are working to get you through underwriting and to get that appraisal back. It usually takes about a week um, to get you that commitment letter as soon as possible. Simultaneously, while we're doing that, we are approving the condo or co-op. That can sometimes take a little longer. Um, but we, my condo team basically works to get the documents from the co-op. Um, again, this is where working with the team is essential because if we're not getting what we need from the management in a timely manner, then we reach out to Victoria and Rashida or Andrew to help us push to get what we need so we can get the project approved. Once you have that commitment letter, um, that basically is saying that the underwriter has looked at everything and is like, yep, this works. And there'll be a few commitment uh, conditions on there, like homeowner's insurance. When you buy a property, you have to pay your first year of homeowner's insurance 
either prior to or at closing. That's usually done closer to closing when we know when you're going to close. Um, and maybe a few other things like an updated pay stub or something like that. With that commitment letter, then you, Victoria has been working with you on the board package and you're going to have all that ready so you can just pop that commitment letter in there and get you in for board approval if you're applying for a co-op. So let's talk about rate for a second. So rates are going down. Very nice to see after a tough year and a half. Um, we are seeing finally the sort of end of, of the increase in rates and every day we're starting to see rates go down, which is really, really great. Um, uh, in terms of rate locking, it's a little bit of a dance because once you lock, you need to close before that rate lock expires or you have to pay extension fees and they can get really expensive really fast. So um, we're gonna have a conversation about it, both at the beginning when you have fully executed contracts, as well as you know down the line in terms of when you decide that you think you know it's right to it's the right time to lock. And I will of course give you my opinion. For a co-op, you typically do not lock up front. The reason being is that you're gonna have to have a board interview and you're gonna have to have co-op board approval. And some co-ops say, hey, I got your board package. Come in tomorrow for the interview. And some co-ops say, you know what? It's going to be two months before we can have an interview with you. And there's no wiggle room there. There's no pushing. So again, that's a conversation that we'll have as to sort of when's the right time to lock. The last thing I'll just say is while rates are going down, um, Everybody that I am doing loans with right now, we are understanding that we're probably going to refinance you in about a year um, to, just because we are in a downward trajectory for rates. Um, so what I always say is you marry the house, you date the rate. So when rates go down and it makes sense to you, we refinance you. Um, and again, we would have a larger conversation about that, you know, when we do your pre-approval process to explain to you what's involved with that. Um, yeah, so then I get the commitment letter and I let Victoria and Andrew and Rashida know and they take it from there. Uh, Victoria, anything you want to add? Hey, Andrew. Okay, yeah, so the, for the co-op package, then we're making sure that your co-op package is submitted in the most beautiful presented way to the co-op board um, and making sure that we follow up them and schedule your board interview making sure you're prepared for your board interview. I have lots of resources. I don't think I mentioned earlier, um, we do everything in Basecamp, which is a project management tool. I'm not sure if people are familiar with it, but every step of the way, we'll have resources for you to help guide you at the inspection, you know, what you should and shouldn't negotiate for, um, learning about rate lock and other mortgage terms to help you educate yourself on negotiating to getting the best product. Like at every step of this process, I've assembled resources for you so that you have can if you're up at three o'clock in the morning and you're going crazy and you're like what is this it's there if i've if it happens in a deal i've thought of it and i've put it in a database um so that people can be educated from my perspective and not some article that relates to you know middle america but it's, it's just a totally different beast here in new york city you want new york city specific resources so you got your board package in Hopefully they're telling you at the board meeting or within 24 to 48 hours that you've been approved. Um, once you've been approved, then you get a letter to the bank saying you've been approved so that they can issue the clear to close. Once you have the clear to close, then the lawyers are working with the bank um, and the co-op or condo lawyer to schedule the closing. We do a final walkthrough 24 to 48 hours before the closing and um, then Andrew, you can talk about the rest. I'm going to have to jump off. I'm going to listen in on the on my phone, but um, you guys, these guys can handle questions. And if not, you guys know how to reach me. And thank you guys, everybody. I'm off to uh, save uh, save Red Hook from the cruise ship terminal, cruise ship <laughs> companies. Awesome. Have a good night. Night. Yeah, so, in in preparing for closing, um, we need uh, two things with a co-op. Um, also two things with a condo. We'll need board approval um, and also final clearance to close from the lender, which you know means that the board has given its blessing for the transaction to happen. Um, and the lender has also reviewed the bar's uh, financials and other documents um, and you know 
made their decision to lend. They're ready to send money to a closing. Um, with a condo, there you know there's a waiver of right of first refusal, which is kind of like um, a board approval process, although not nearly as involved. Um, but once we have those items, we you know we'll start planning for a closing. Um, and what that looks like is. Um, first, working up some numbers with the bank, giving the bank all of the information that it needs in order to prepare its closing disclosure, which it's required to distribute to borrowers, um, you know, a certain number of business days in advance of any closing date. Um, once we have that, you know, we'll start scheduling, which is, you know, sometimes difficult, but most of the time, you know, doable because, you know, everybody wants to close, so they make themselves available. Um, but we do have a lot of parties involved, uh, buyer, seller, buyer's attorney, seller's attorney, lender's attorney, co-op's attorney. Um, so, you, you know, you're talking about at least five or six individuals who need to find a, a mutually convenient date and time on their calendar, which can be tough, but, you know, uh, we work it out. And uh, in preparation for closing, we advise the purchaser um, of how much money they will need to close. Uh, you know, the, the mortgage or the loan is going to cover a certain portion of the price um, owed to the seller. Um, but we also have to consider there are closing costs, which uh, we provide an estimate for at the outset of the transaction. And at the, the back end of the transaction, when we're preparing to close, we have... Um, you know, final numbers, which we, we calculate, review with our clients, let them know how much money they need to actually close and who they will be paying. Um, and that comes in the form of a closing statement, which is, um, you know, calculates who owes what to whom um, and what needs to be paid in order to close a transaction. Uh, closing, you know, lasts about um, you know, 60 or 90 minutes uh, if everybody arrives on time and there are no complications. And usually the closings are uneventful, and that is a good thing because all of the work should be done in advance of closing. There, you know, there should not be anything left to sort out at the closing table. Very last minute, but, you know, if nothing comes up, and you're working with competent folks on, on all sides, everything's ironed out in advance, everybody walks into the closing knowing what to expect, um, you know, nothing, nothing is questionable at that time. So everybody's just checking items off their list. Um, you know, the bank is making sure that all of its loan documents are executed, the seller is making sure, sure that they are receiving all of the money that they're entitled to, um, purchasers making sure that they get keys so they can go to their new home after the closing. And, um, you know, once closing is over, it's, you know, happy time for everybody. A um, little bit of a celebration. And uh, what we provide, the, the last thing that we do in representation is provide a closing package after the closing, which is copies of all of the documents executed at closing, some additional items um, for our clients' records and for the future. And two things I would just add, everything Andrew said was just spot on. Um, you do not want to schedule movers until you know when you're going to close, which means a closing date is scheduled. Um, a lot of times people want to schedule movers, you know, because they want to like make sure that they're, they're trying to coordinate so that they're not in their apartment one more day than they have to. It adds ridiculous stress that is just not necessary. It's a stressful enough as it is. So wait until Andrew and Rashida tell you when you have your scheduled close date, or even better, wait until you close to schedule movers and to, you know, um, get into your new home. Yeah, and also very, 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 very important to remember about the closing date is that we use on or about closing dates. Mm -hmm. And the words on or about open up a 60-day window within which we can close. Um, so when a contract is signed, we don't know when we're going to close. Um, we have variables that we can't control. We don't know when the board will issue its approval. We don't know when the lender will be ready to close. Um, you know, for all the reasons that Lisa, uh, described as reasons to 
not lock your rate at the beginning of a co-op transaction is why we don't have a specific um, closing date. And even though you might see a date in the contract, like on or about March 15th, that's just a target. There's no guarantee um, that you will close on March 15th. For all we know, March 15th could be a Saturday. Um, and it's, you know, it's just the middle of that closing window. And we don't close on weekends. We don't close after hours. Um, you know, it's almost always somewhere between 11 a.m. and 3 p.m. start time, Monday to Friday, when banks are open to you no know, federal holidays. Um, and uh, yeah, just remember, closing is uh, not set any more than probably about a week or two in advance. So you do need to kind of be on standby. And as Lisa mentioned, scheduling movers very far in advance is not a wise choice. So now I think we'll just open it up to any questions. If you guys have any questions, you can type them into the chat. Um, and uh, and yeah, so we'll just wait maybe one or two minutes to see if any questions come in. We're happy to answer them. Um, and then go from there. So I think that might be about it. Sarah, can you go to the final slide that has me and Victoria's contact info? And here's our contact info. Um, so feel free to reach out to me or Victoria. We can both. But it won't be brisk enough to make it feel like the team's overnight. We're expecting that. Um, I think you're not on mute, uh, Jasmine. I don't know if you have a question or if you're just inadvertently not on mute. Um, but yeah, so this is our contact information. Feel free to reach out to Victoria or myself if you have any questions, um, and um, or Rashida as well. Um, both Rashida, both Victoria and I both use Calendly, which is a great way to schedule an appointment. And we can jump on a 15-minute call or longer to sort of chat about how we can help either now or in the future. And just so you know, I'm totally happy to talk to people that are like just starting the process and not sure if they're going to buy now or in the future, but they just want information. Um, that's 100% fine. And um, and I actually have a client that recently closed that I've been working with for three years, which is always really fun. So um, so yeah, I think at that, unless there's any questions, I'll let you guys go. Um, hope you enjoyed the webinar and yeah, reach out with any information you need from either from anyone on our team. Perfect. Yeah, thanks everyone. Lots of luck in your search. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye.